So today we're going to be uh, introducing mixture models and introducing the definition of mixture models. Mixture models are probability distributions that can account for a variety of features in the data, including multimodality and skewness. Uh, the idea of mixture models is uh, to take multiple probability distributions and put them together in some sense using a linear combination. Uh, more formally, if we have a random variable x uh, with density f of x, this can be the density or probability density function. Or if it's discrete, it can be the probability mass function PMF. This is in the continuous case and in the discrete case. And we have capital F of X that it's the probability distribution function so that f of x is the probability that your random variable is less or equal than a given number. Um, then for a mixture model, the probability mass, the probability distribution function it's going to take the, so the form of a sum over k pieces that we're going to consider the components of some weights times some other group of probability distribution functions. So these are typically called the weights. And these are called the components. And what we typically ask of the weights and the components is that the weights sum up to 1. And uh, G1 all the way to G capital K are uh, cumulative distribution functions. Okay, because the probability mass function takes the form of a sum, the probability mass function or the probability density function, depending on whether it's a discrete or a continuous distribution, will take a similar form. where the lowercase g just corresponds to the density or the PMF of uh, g sub x, capital G sub x, depending on whether, again, this uh, distribution corresponds to a discrete or a continuous uh, random variable. Let's consider some examples of mixture models. One that we will encounter repeatedly and that we will work often with is a mixture of normal distributions. And in a mixture of normal distributions, the density will take the form sum from 1 to capital K of the weights times the density of a normal. And as you may recall, the density of a normal distribution takes the form 2 pi sigma x minus 1 over 2 sigma square x minus mu sub i s square, mu sub k s square. So this is a particular example where only the mean of each one of the normals depends on the component index. And we allow the, the variance to be the same across all the components. So we sometimes call this a location mixture of normals. 
uh, again, because uh, the only parameter that depends on the index of the sum is uh, the mean of the normal distribution that controls the location of that distribution. But we can uh, write a more general mixture that will be actually more flexible and more helpful, that it's a location scale mixture uh, where we allow both parameters to depend on the index component. So in that case, we may write, uh, again, the sum of the weights, and now 1 over square root 2 pi, sigma sub k, so that we allow the variance to be different, uh, x minus 1 over 2 sigma k, x minus mu sub k square. So this is a location a scale mixture of normals. As we will see in a minute, uh, this location a scale mixture of normals have a lot of flexibility. They allow you, for example, to capture multimodal distributions. Uh, Multimodal distributions often arise when uh, you have multiple populations uh, and you are not aware of that. Uh, consider, for example, trying to um, model the weight of various dogs. Uh, and you may have different breeds of dogs within that population. And if you have big dogs and small dogs, that will probably end up looking a little bit like uh, two humps. So if you think about this being the weight, in this, the probability mass function associated with the weight. Then if you have chihuahuas, for example, they will tend to have lower weights. And if you have uh, German shepherds, they will tend to have a higher weight. And there will be very little overlap between the two groups. So a mixture model that allows the means of these two pieces to be far away from each other and that have relatively narrow values of sigma k will allow you to capture a pattern that looks like this. Um, another example uh, in which this kind of mixture models uh, of normals is useful is if you're trying to capture a skewness uh, in the data. For example, uh, rather than trying to capture something that is completely symmetric around the mean, there are situations in which your distribution may have a very uh, heavy fat tail in one direction and not on the other. Examples of situations where this arises are, for example, variables such as the population of countries or states, uh, income, um, land size for different countries. All those are variables that tend to be highly skewed. You have a few countries or, or a few individuals that make large incomes and then you have the majority of your population somewhere down here. So, so for distributions that have that type of pattern, uh, a mixture of normals where the means are different but not too different and that have relatively large variances will allow you to uh, obtain shapes that look a little bit like this. In the examples that we just saw, uh, we used uh, the same uh, distribution, the same kernel for all components in the mixture. That tends to be the case that will be uh, very common in many of the applications that we will be looking at. But in some circumstances, you may want to consider two different or multiple different uh, families for the different kernels that you work with. For example, you can consider a mixture of a normal distribution uh, where the density of the mixture will take the form omega 1 times 1 over square root 2 pi sigma x minus 1 over 2 sigma square x minus mu square with a second uh, density that, for example, could be an exponential. And in this case, this is going to be 1 minus w1. Remember that the weights uh, need to adapt to 1. So instead of writing omega 2, I could easily just write 1 minus omega 1. Uh, and then a density of an exponential with parameter lambda. And in this case, because of the way in which I parameterize the exponential distribution, lambda just represents the mean of this exponential. So generally speaking, we can have different families for each one of the kernels of the distribution. Another example of using two different kernels for uh, the mixture comes up for zero inflated 
There you are. This arises very often when you are dealing with discrete data. Uh, and graphically, the motivation for, for uh, dealing with zero inflated data comes from situations where uh, you are counting, for example, the number of eggs that you see in a nest. Uh, if you just look at uh, nests that have eggs, you may see something that looks, and you construct a histogram, you may obtain something that looks a little bit like this. But uh, once you take into account uh, nests that have no eggs, so this would be uh, the, the shape of what you're observing. Excuse me. One, two, three, four, five. This is the number of eggs. And this is the frequency. This is only for uh, nests that have X, but then when you add the nests that have no X, you may see suddenly a spike. So you may have a large number of uh, nests that have no X, and then uh, the rest of the shape that you observed before. Zero, one. So a shape like this can be captured by a number of standard distributions that you may be familiar with. For example, the Poisson distribution or the negative binomial distribution. But a shape like this won't be captured naturally by any of these standard distributions that you may be familiar with. So one way to deal with the situation is to consider a mixture of uh, the Poisson or the negative binomial with essentially something that puts a lot of weight on zero. So uh, for example, we could work with a mixture in which we have a first component, and in this case, this is a probability mass function. Here, this was the probability density function. Now this is going to be discrete. So for example, we can take a Poisson distribution with a parameter lambda. So that would be e to the minus lambda lambda to the x over x factorial. So this is the probability mass function for the, for the Poisson. And then mix that with a point mass at 0. So this is essentially a probability mass function that puts all probability on 0, that it's the number here in the subscript. So by working with a mixture of this type, we allow uh, to have, in, on one hand, the regular shape that is controlled by this piece of the mixture, and then uh, the spike at 0 is essentially controlled or modeled by this uh, point mass at 0. To slightly clarify the notation, uh, we just discussed two different examples, one in which the components of the mixture belong to the same family, one in which the components of the mixture belong to different families. So the most general notation for the mixture will be one, uh, the one that we introduced in the very beginning in which we write the probability mass function or the probability density function, uh, depending on, on the type of random variable, as a sum of omega k capital G sub x. In this notation, we allow G sub k to belong to any family, and, and the families could be different from different k's. When all the g's belong to the same family, then uh, it's usually useful to uh, slightly alter the notation and write this in the following form. Again, it's uh, still a sum. But we're going to uh, make the dependence of the, each one of the components on its parameters explicit. And we will write it in this form. So in this case, this is the parameters of the family. In the case of the normal, these were mu and sigma square, so the mean and the variance of the normal. 
Uh, and this makes explicit that the functional form of g is always the same. So you, in every case, you have 1 over square root 2 pi uh, times sigma k times an exponential. And what changes between one component and the next is just the specific values of some of the parameters that make that functional form. So sometimes we will use this notation in the most general case. Uh, but when we are working with uh, families in which the g is the same for everybody and the only thing that changes is the parameter, we'll use this alternative notation to make that explicit and, and clarify. Now, uh, one uh, situation that we need to understand a little bit more is, uh, is what are the properties of these mixture models that we are working with. And the two key properties that one is interested in when, uh, when you look at uh, probability distribution function, probability mass functions, is what is the expected value and what is the variance of the random variable. Uh, those are actually relatively simple to obtain because of the relatively simple structure of these uh, functions. Okay, so first we're interested in the expectation of x when the probability mass function or the probability density function can be written in the form of a mixture. And for now, I'm going to write it in the most general form. So I'm going to consider kernels that are potentially different uh, from each other. So I want the expected value of x under f. And so this lowercase f here just indicates what is the probability mass function or that I'm using to compute the, or probability density function that I'm using to compute the expectation. So by definition, this expected value is just the integral in principle between minus infinity and infinity if we are talking about a unidimensional uh, random variable of x times f of x dx. And because of the form of f, we can just substitute that back. And what we get is the integral of x sum from k equals 1 to capital K of omega k g sub k of x dx between minus infinity and infinity. And now we know that because the sum is finite, we can exchange the integral and the sum. So these are two operations that commute. So instead, we could write this as the sum from minus infinity to infinity of omega k. So the other thing that is important to note is that omega k doesn't depend on x, so it can come out of the integral itself. Uh, and so we get the integral between minus infinity and infinity of x g sub k of x dx. But now if you consider what this integral is, that integral just by definition turns out to be, again, an expected value for x, but instead of being computing, computed under f, it gets computed under g sub k. So the expected value turns out to be uh, the sum from uh, k equals 1 to infinity of omega sub k times the expected value, but now under g sub k, of that random variable x. And this, is an in, in, in this provides a very clear interpretation of what the mixture is doing. So remember, these omega sub k's add up to 1, so you can think about them as quakes. And so the expected value of the mixture is just the weighted sum of the expected value of each one of the components in the mixture. In addition to the expectation, we're interested in the variance of the random variable. And the procedure to compute the variance is going to be very similar. It's just a slightly longer calculation. So if you remember the variance, again, under f of the random variable x is defined as the expected value under f 
of x squared minus the expected value on the ref of x along raised to the square. This calculation we have already know, done, and we know what the answer for it is. The, the one that we need to compute now is this expected value of the square of the random variable. So let's do that. The expected value under f of x squared is, again, by definition, the integral of uh, x squared sum from k equals 1 to capital K of omega k g sub k of x dx that using the same argument that we did before becomes the integral or the sum of the integral or omega k times the integral of x squared g sub k of x dx in for the same, just in the same argument as before, this is just the expected value of x squared under g sub k. So this is the sum from k equals 1 to capital K of omega sub k expected value, but now under g sub k of x squared. Now, let me turn this formula on its head. So we know we can compute this or at least relate this expected value of x squared with the variance and the expected value of the original random variable by basically uh, substituting back to the right the expected value of x squared. So uh, that just means that this expression can also be written as the sum from k equals 1 to capital K of omega sub k that multiplies the variance under g sub k of x plus the expected value under g sub k of x the square. And now substituting back into the definition of the variance for f, what we have is the variance under f for x is going to be equal to this expression, this sum minus the expected value under f, but that expected value that we just computed is the sum of omega sub k times the expected value under g sub k of x squared. Now, one thing that I want to highlight is that there is no easy simplification here. So we cannot cancel the terms that involve the expectation of g sub k squared here with the terms that appear on this side. Uh, so unlike the case of the expectation where we had a really nice simple expression where we could say that the expected value of f under f was just a weighted average of the expected values under g sub k, in general, the variance of f won't be just something as simple as a linear combination of the variances of the different uh, components of the mixture. Except in one very simple case, if the expected value of g sub k is the same for all of the components, and you can say that they are the same and that they are zero. So if the expected value under g sub k of x is equal to 0 for all k, then under, under this k, what we get is that the variance under f of x can be written simply as the sum of omega k times the variance under g sub k of x. 
And that's because this term becomes zero and this term becomes zero and you only retain omega sub k times the variance of g sub k. But that is in general uh, one of the few circumstances in which you, you can write the variance of f as a weighted average of the variances of g. Uh, of the G sub case. Otherwise, uh, you have a much more complicated uh, structure for the distribution.